peak cheap energy means they're going to run out of dollar uh, dollars in reserves because they are growing their economy. So their oil demand is going up. Peak cheap energy means the price of that oil is going up. So they're going to run out of dollars. And when they run out of dollars, they are, have two choices. Economic Mad Max slash energy usage, people starve and die, economy collapses, or you find an energy producer willing to sell outside the dollar, Russia. Okay, there you go. And so the back end of this for the US is all of a sudden people say, oh, wait, the Russians will sell to me my own currency. Great. I don't need to buy as many of these dollar treasury bonds, and I, but I do need to own gold. And so you can see over the last 10 years, central bank gold reserves are up four or $500 billion. Central bank treasury reserves, FX reserves, foreign exchange reserves are down three, four hundred billion dollars. My name is Max Gagliardi, and this is Always Be Building. If you're watching this video, take a moment, hit the subscribe button on YouTube, or you can follow me on your favorite podcast app. Hope you enjoy the show. Luke, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me back on, Max. It's great to be here. Yeah, I think we talked almost exactly a year ago. It was May of last year. Uh, to start out, just like your recap on what's happened. A lot's happened kind of in the energy market. Rates have r risen a lot since then. Um, just your kind of recap on the last 12 months. Yeah, I think the recap on the last 12 months has been, it's been pretty volatile in a word you've seen as you mentioned rates rise a whole lot we had oil spike in response to uh the geopolitical events last year with russia ukraine etc uh we've had a policymaker response to that in terms of rate hikes uh spr releases trying to get oil down trying to get inflation down uh, we saw markets last year that uh, we had the worst performance in U.S. stock and bond markets in 157 years. We had the first time in at least 70 years where uh, in a top 20 drawdown for stocks, the U.S. Treasury market sold off more than stocks did. Uh, we saw oil ultimately did come down. We saw slowing growth. We saw inflation softening sequentially. Uh, underneath all of this, I think there are still some really important factors um, that have that were that were issues when they started uh, with tightening uh, and when the war started, and that their actions to fight inflation uh, have made a lot worse and a lot more acute. And by that specifically, I mean. Uh, the peak cheap energy crisis and the global sovereign debt bubble. Yeah, a lot to get into there. Uh, let's start off with inflation. You know, we've seen a lot of things recently. Like you mentioned it just in that opening statement. Uh, things that, you know, prices have come down. We've seen energy prices come down, uh, lumber, commodities broadly, freight prices are way down. Uh, you're seeing food in some areas. You're seeing housing and uh, and rental numbers, which haven't really rolled through to CPI yet. Just your thoughts on kind of like the state of the inflation prints currently and just generally your thoughts on where that's heading uh, here in the kind of near and midterm. Yeah, I think you've seen this this marked sequential softening. Um, the problem is that the only thing keeping the West in particular, uh, the U.S. specifically, uh, the world more broadly, the only thing that was keeping global sovereign debt from being at risk of nominal default was the very same inflation that these uh, um, that these uh, that these central bankers have been fighting, and so uh, you go back in time um, to uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, by virtue of the everything bubble, by virtue of uh, eight seven eight percent CPI, the U.S. was able to get. And I'm going to pick on the U.S. where I spend most of my time, and most importantly, the reserve currency issuer primary reserve, uh, incumbent primary reserve asset issuer. So going back in time, a year ago, uh, by virtue of the everything bubble and the 7 8% inflation uh, here in the US, the US was able to get tax receipts back above it, it, its treasury spending, its interest and its interest-like obligations. In other words, the current portion of the 100 trillion plus and off balance sheet applications, the entitlement pay goes. So you were, you were, that number by virtue of 
had, had, has risen to as high as about 110, 115% of tax receipts. So basically the US government was not going to be able to pay interest and entitlements out of tax receipts for a full year uh, at the height of the COVID bubble. Okay, so inflation, tax receipt bubble, thanks to everything bubble, they get it back down to where they can and, North, and then they just raise rates on inflation. That number is back above 100%. So right now, we are now, after the first half of this year, we are now in a position where the U.S. government um, can't make its interest in interest-like obligation payments for a full year out of tax receipts. And tax receipts are getting worse because they're interest rate sensitive. And expenses are rising because the average interest rate at the end of 2022 on the U.S. debt was still only like 2%. So yeah. uh, they are setting up for a really interesting scenario where the only thing keeping them from nominal default on their obligations was the inflation. Their central banks are now fighting in the U.S. and more broadly. Uh, I suspect we will continue to see weakening sequential inflation. The problem, the thing that I think people aren't seeing yet is this has now pushed the U.S. into a situation where it can't pay these interest and interest like obligations out of receipts for a full year, uh, which means the U.S. government's going to acceleratingly crowd out um, global dollar markets. So what this sets up for is basically sometime in the next I don't know, six to nine months. Uh, a very severe downdraft in the economy. And you're starting to see whispers of it. The banks, the bank issues earlier this year was the first tremor. You're seeing a reduction in lending. You're seeing some huge markdowns in CRE. You're going to see more huge markdowns in VC. You're seeing huge declines in tax receipts uh, at the state level, at the federal. Uh, you're seeing declines at the federal level. They're going to get worse. And you're going to get into basically a giant capital crunch sometime in the next like I said, I think it's easily within the next six to nine months. And what that looks like is markets do this, and inflation does this, this. And now when you have deflation, that point I made before where I said right now the U.S. government cannot pay its interest and interest like obligations out of tax receipts for a full year, that number will get shrunk massively. The tax receipts will plummet. And now they're going to be at risk of nominal default within away from anything with the debt ceiling, all this, 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 this fundamentally, not some fake debt ceiling target political number. Fundamentally, they will not have tax receipts to pay more than six to nine months of expenses. And when that happens, that gets you into what we saw in 2022 on steroids, which is dollar up, inflation down, uh, everything else down rates will probably tick down for a second and then begin to rise even in a u.s recession um it's 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 the mother of all bad scenarios and my guess is you'll see gold rise in that scenario along with the dollar yeah it's good uh you're hitting on a bunch of things i have for questions here i think an important <laughs> yeah i think the important point that you're making and it's kind of counterintuitive is that the fed is sitting here trying to fight inflation but the, you know, inflation in these rising tax receipts is a big, you know, driver for funding uh, on the fiscal side. And you're seeing those receipts fall pretty dramatically, as you've mentioned. Uh, and that's not a good thing. I, I'm sure you saw this recent uh, Stanley Druckenmiller uh, speech that he gave, and he talked about the entitlements and it really, you know, it rhymed with a lot of the things that you say uh, that when I follow you and listen to your stuff. And Basically, he was saying, look, you know, by the time and he was throwing out dates that weren't that far away. I mean, like within my children's, you know, by the time they're in college, basically, uh, my youngest child, you know, we could be at a place where, you know, entitlements alone are at 110 percent of uh, the tax base in terms of what we're bringing in. And so just it's just this counterintuitive thing where they're trying to fight inflation, but the fighting of the inflation uh, is actually going to harm the way that the government operates because we're the you know when right rates go up it makes it harder to borrow we're the biggest borrower in the world yeah there's this weird and and there's there's a fiscal impulse to all this too that you know i i think inflation will continue to moderate in the private sector but we're gonna get to a spot probably in the not too distant future and and, and i wrestle with this a lot the, the challenge is is there's no fundamental difference between um, 
the government basically run you know six hundred billion dollars stimu you know stimulus right so giving everybody a stimmy you know printing up six hundred billion uh, and, and having the Fed print up six hundred billion give it to Treasury Treasury gives it to everybody six hundred billion dollars stimmy boom okay we know how that works we know that's inflationary if the Fed raises rates and interest expense goes up six hundred billion dollars like they've done on a on a pro forma basis that's there's really no difference between six hundred billion in interest. And 600 billion in um, STEMI, uh, except who it goes to. Um, right. You know, it goes to the wealthy in the case of the of the interest, who then spend it into the economy. So it's more of a Cantillon effect down the road, but it's still inflationary. It goes to the military industrial complex. It's inflationary uh, versus everybody, where it's much more. It's almost like um, you know, uh, uh, you know, getting high slowly versus sort of you know high grade. You know, the, the stimmy to everybody is like high grade heroin right into your veins, right? So in terms of the inflationary impact, um, but but here's the point. When you're doing it via the interest rates, they're curtailing private sector demand, private sector capacity growth, but they are increasing government printing, government um, spending emissions into the economy without increasing the capacity in the economy to address that. So there is this they're going to get to a tipping point. I don't know when that tipping point is. I don't think it's years from now. And maybe it's six months from now. Maybe it's 12 months from now. Uh, I don't know. Um, where government deficits are inflationary and they are rising and they're going to keep rising because interest is going up and defense is going up and entitlements are going up. And at the same time, the productive side, the private side of the U.S. economy, because government doesn't make anything. All they do is spend. Uh the private side is shrinking by virtue of these rate increases. So you, if you shrink capacity while increasing spending by raising rates, you're not fighting inflation anymore. You're increasing inflation, the inflationary impulse. You're increasing supply chain problems. You're increasing demand, money out in the economy while shrinking the ability to uh, you know, produce output for that money. So there's this I, I do think we will continue to see a decline in uh, inflation sequentially, but A, I don't think it's going to be as far as people think. Um, and, and B, I think we're going to get to this fiscal problem well before inflation's back to two, where the Fed has to start printing to finance the government. Yeah. It's this counterintuitive thing again, where it's like we're raising rates to squash inflation, but there's two sides of the equation. There's supply and demand, and this rolls through to energy. It rolls through to manufacturing. It rolls through to housing. It rolls through to basically everything with this risk-free rate. And when it goes up, you're really hurting you know, productivity in a lot of ways because if you're an oil field services company, you live and die by credit. Um, to get more rigs out, to get more frack crews, to do these things, you have to be able to run your business. These guys have a very tight cash conversion cycle, and they're not the only type of business that has that. There's a lot of heavy CapEx businesses that really rely on credit um, to expand their productive capacity. And so, you know, if you're hurting the ability to bring on new supply, that's kind of inflationary, right? I mean, it's sort of like doing the opposite in a lot of ways. Maybe it hurts demand in the near term, but longer term, you're setting yourself up for less supply. Is that right? Yeah. And, and I think that with energy, there's very, uh, we're in a very special case that most of these economists and analysts and Fed people have never seen before. You know, I wrote about this a few weeks ago for clients where it was a report titled Assume a Can Opener, right? In, in, in reference to the old um, uh, economic um, joke, right? right? There's, there's a physicist and a chemist and an economist stuck on a desert, you know, desert isle out in the middle of the ocean and they have a can of food. And they're trying to figure out how to open this can of food that's washed ashore. Um, and the physicist and the chemist come up with all these mechanical and, and, and chemical reaction, brilliant ways of getting the can opener. And the economist says, no, 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 no. Let's just assume a can opener. And in this same way, I am watching with great interest and, and more than a little horror as I watched Fed, economist, macro guys miss the forest for the trees on this, which is to say they're talking about what's the neutral rate of interest, what's real interest rate, what's the, the but, but they're focused on the dollar. They're focused on treasury yields. Those things, they, they're operating in a world 
where the base, true base money, true base rate, which is energy, has just, it's always been assumed, right? Assume a can opener. So they're just assuming cheap and cheaper energy, uh, the cheap and cheaper energy regime that they have come of age in will continue. We don't need to think. However, we can see on the ground, you know, in the oil patch, the inflation rates of of energy. I mean, I was at a, a presentation uh, back in January and I used Dallas Fed numbers as said, you know, eight to 10 percent cost inflation. And everyone is was down in Texas and everyone started laughing at me. <laughs> and and I said, well, what's funny? They said eight to 10. Are you like, are you crazy? 15 minimum, 20, 25, 30 percent cost inflation. Uh, and here's the point. I just use eight to 10 to make my point because 15, 20, 30 is a slam dunk, right? Eight to 10 percent cost inflation is what we need minimum to keep U.S. shale production flat. That's the minimum, like the, the, the Dallas Fed survey said the minimum, you know, the break even barrel has gone up eight to 10 percent last year. That's what their estimate of, based on surveying producers. So here's the problem. If you have eight to 10 percent cost inflation needed for energy just to keep energy production flat. And again, the U.S. shale production is estimated to have been 90 percent of global oil production growth over the last 10 years. So 90 percent of your production growth over the last 10 years needs eight to 10 percent inflation minimum just to stay in the same place, let alone grow production in a real way. Uh, to address, to, to basically keep all the debt that's out there from defaulting. Because if you start having declining energy production, you have declining economic growth, you're gonna have, you're gonna unwind all of it. So that then sets up a situation where you need eight to 10% energy inflation minimum just to keep the wheels on the cart, which means somebody needs to hold, you know, the US has what, 31 trillion in federal debt, there's 120 trillion globally in dollar denominated debt. Somebody needs to be the sucker at the card table to hold that debt at 3% while energy grows 8 to 10% a year to keep production going. And so the question is, who's the sucker at the card table who has the balance sheet able to take those types of losses, those types of declines in living standards relative to energy? And the answer is nobody. It's just the Fed. The only person who has the balance sheet is the Fed and the other Western central banks, which, of course, if they have to print the money, they're only going to make that 8 to 10 percent, 12 to 15 percent, 15. To, so there's this fascinating discussion that isn't taking place in the whole inflation dynamic, which is it's not about the dollar. It's not about rates. It's not about breaky. It's about energy. If you don't have the energy, the whole thing comes. I'm going to read. Let me read two quotes to you. Um, in central bank circles, it's well known that the world debt markets as we know them can only be maintained with cheap and cheaper oil. Without cheap oil, the entire system fails. This is from a, a mon an anonymous monetary theorist, another, 1997. So that's exactly what this guy was describing 25 years ago, 26 years ago, which is if oil prices need secular inflation to, to keep production growing, but the debt markets need, can't afford Right. I mean, you look at eight to 10 percent, you're going to need just to keep yourself whole on a real basis relative to what your energy is doing. Your debt needs to have an eight to 10 percent coupon on it. U.S. government can't afford eight to 10 percent. It is it is bankrupt at eight to 10 percent. Every government, except for maybe the Russians, are bankrupt at eight to 10 percent. So like that is the fundamental problem here within this inflation discussion that is just not happening yet. But I think it's going to start to happen in the next six to nine months. Reminds me of the quote, I think, I don't know if you made the quote up, but you said it, I believe, on our last episode, which is you can print money, but you can't print barrels. I don't know. I've seen that before. And then it, recently I saw you either tweet or I heard it on a podcast you did where you mentioned, uh, you know, energy is kind of like the discount rate. It's like nature's discount rate. Uh, and it's just like it's critical. And we're, you know, how much do you think this cheap energy over the last, call it 10 to 15 years in that deflationary force has played a role in kind of all these global macro forces. And now that we're maybe reaching the end of kind of this peak uh, cheap energy era, what are the ripple effects there? Oh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, 
<laughs> you know, there's a great quote. Um, you know, everyone's seen the movie Titanic, I'm sure, right? There's a scene in it where Bill Paxton says he has 26 years of experience working against him. He figures anything big enough to sink the ship, he's going he's gonna to see it in time to turn. Ship's too big. It's got too small a rudder. It doesn't corner or worth a darn. Everything he It's the same thing here. Everything these economists know is wrong in a post in, in a peak cheap energy world um you 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 cannot you basically you have to either financially repress investors dramatically in other words you have to force regulate etc people into holding uh debt that falls in price against energy, which means against food, against economic, a collapse in living standards by the tune of, you know, like I said, eight to 10% is probably minimum uh, in terms of keeping production okay. Um, it's probably more than that, but just say eight to 10% with a three and a half percent coupon on the 10 year, um, you, you're, you need that's eight to 10 minus three and a half is whatever, four and a half to, to six and a half percent per year, negative real rates against energy, re financial repression, basically living standards need to fall four and a half to 6%, 6.5% per year ad infinitum. That's, it's, it's, you're not going to get very far before you're going to have political problems, et cetera, et cetera, uh, economic problems, uh, other areas of debt. The other, only other option you really have, I guess there's two. Um, the only other two options have is number one, uh, you change the economic system. You basically move, you devalue the currency and you shift to um, reserving gold instead of reserving debt as your FX reserves. And so you can see central banks have been doing that for almost 10 years now. It got much more pronounced last year. That has enormous implications for gold prices, Bitcoin prices, energy prices, inflation rates, um, you know, owning 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 assets and industrial assets and, and commodity assets that will 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 outperform secularly against things like tech etc um and i think we're i think that's the most likely outcome i think we're we're, we're moving lurching with fits and starts and, and back steps in that direction having tried the first and having watched it fail and the third option is is you go to war you go to war, basically, you, you try to start a proxy war with, you know, the world's biggest commodity exporter and you you try to overthrow its government and you try to, you know, get someone like a Boris Yeltsin back into the Soviet Union. So they'll sell all the oil cheap and in, in the correct currency, etc. And, you know, I think that there's a lot more to the Ukraine, uh, Russia situation than just Ukraine's freedom. I think it has a lot more to do with energy commodities and this dynamic we're talking about. But that's a separate discussion. So it is it is hard to overstate how important uh, it is if the peak cheap dynamic, peak cheap energy dynamic um, and uh, if, if we don't either do one of those three things or find some energy productivity miracle, right? Nuclear fusion, or we, we roll out some sort of energy efficiency uh, thing that, that group that uh, really changes the game. Yeah. I mean, there's a stark difference too, between these different countries and their approaches to energy. You've got uh, the Russia, you've got the Middle Eastern countries that seem to clearly understand the importance of, you know, control of their energy resources and maximizing the value there building critical energy, you know, infrastructure for energy. And then you have kind of the Western world who really, I mean, I know we can't print barrels, but there's a lot of, you know, barrels under the ground in federal leases. Um, there's a lot of critical energy infrastructure that we could build that would be dis, you know, disinflationary in terms of new refineries, uh, pipelines, things like that. We're basically doing the opposite in terms of even nuclear energy. Uh, really, we're not seeing a renaissance there either. In fact, we're seeing the opposite. We've taken a lot of steps backwards. It's kind of like the space race. It's, it was, you know, it took off there for a while and now it's been declining. And it just seems like there has to be some kind of pivot here in the Western world to have a more focus on these critical energy infrastructure on more supply of energy uh, to be able to, you know, because if you look at these other countries, look at, you know, look at the investments that they're making. What is Russia doing? They're not buying into the to the green stuff, neither Saudi Arabia, maybe Saudi Arabia says it on the surface, but 
can the Western leaders, is, is there ever going to be a pivot in their take on energy or they, you think they're just going to stay on the path that we're on, which seems to be <laughs> kind of divided on political lines? Uh, I don't know. Um, I think at some point, you know, the old, the Americans always do the right thing after they've exhausted all the alternatives quote from, from Winston Churchill, uh, will yeah. hold once again. Um, I don't know how bad the economic situation has to get to get there because you're right. I mean, we're in this, this PhD standard, this military, you know, and, you know, PhD standard where, you know, option one is assume a can opener, right? Assume cheap oil. Well, cheap oil is gone, right? It's, we're not running out of oil, but it's with the, the, it's not that it's gone, but the, the supply, it's peak cheap energy. We, the, the, the incremental supplies require expensive investment. Uh, they, they tend to be more expensive barrels than sort of the, you know, the conventional major wells, uh, you know, fields that have that, that have powered the last hundred years. Uh, and so they are just completely, you know, they assume interest rates, you know, they discuss interest rates in dollar and neutral rates and our star, and they never mention energy. Never. Like you, it's fascinating. You, you can you can look up these academic papers and they're talked about as brilliant and this. And they are brilliant, don't we? But they're academic. You hit control find, right? There's not one mention of the word energy. There's not one mention of the word oil, not one mention of the word gas in 50, 80 pages of these papers. So it's it's you know it, it's magical thinking. It's it which is not what we need here. So um I I don't, you know, and and, and you know, sort of point two they fall back to is well, we we have a military. Worst case, we can just fall back to the military. And and of course, uh you know, beating up Iraq and beating up Russia are two very different things, as we're finding out. Um, right. And so there doesn't seem to be a lot of more thought being given to the reality of their situation. And again, this is not like, oh, the world's ending this. But this is. It's it, it is the end of this debt backed system that has sort of evolved a couple times since World War Two, again, for a very fundamental reason. There are no suckers at the card table with a big enough balance sheet to be financially repressed to the tune of 31 trillion in federal debt, 120 trillion in global debt. If energy costs are going to rise secularly at eight to 10 percent per year minimum. You need either eight to ten percent plus rates. You need positive real rates in energy terms, or you need to restructure the system. And they don't like change, and so I think that's partly why they these policymakers are refusing to acknowledge, you know, physics. Um, and in the end, I don't know who said. I don't know if it was Doomberg or somebody else. Physics is undefeated. You know, f physics is undefeated against happy thinking and and magical thinking and, and academic economist projections of where our star should be. The physics are going to assert themselves. The physics are asserting themselves. When does the political dynamic change? Uh, I, I don't know. Right now there are no, you know, there's not a lot of market signals signifying an emergency to these people unless you know what you're looking for, right? You talk to people right. in the oil patch and you go, okay, like, Hey guys, 90% of production growth over the last 10 years from shale, and we can see what shale production are doing. We can see the productivity numbers. Um, I mean, you've seen it in, in the Bakken, you've seen it in Eagleford, you've seen it in Niobrara, even now the Permian, the, the monstrous Permian, the productivity numbers are starting to wane, which should be red flag, sirens, emergency, and instead, you know, we're hearing, you know, them pontificate about you know, the, the stuff they've been pontificating about. Um, and so it's not an emergency yet to them, but it, 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 like I said, I think it's going to be in coming, you know, in the next, you know, next year or two. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I've heard you say you don't envy Jerome Powell. And, uh, in fact, you maybe feel sorry for him a little bit, but you know, he's in a situation where he doesn't have that many tools I think I've heard you criticize maybe some of the ways that they're handling things. And if they continue on the path they're on, if you were in, uh, if you got to wear that hat, if, you know, we made you the, his role right now, what would you, uh, what would you be thinking? What would you be doing? Uh, if you had to say what a better policy path forward would be, uh, given what you know now. If I was Powell, 
knowing what I know, I would be on a beach somewhere because I would be worth a hundred million dollars <laughs> and I would have resigned at the end of 21. Um, yeah. you know, when, when I, I would not have, I would not have even tried to jockey for that, uh, the, the getting reappointed, I would have been, I'd be gone. Okay. So let's let's, let's pretend I am not drinking a frozen margarita in a very exotic location and in some $10,000 a night resort room. Um, if I was him, he has two paths forward. He can continue on the path forward that he is on fighting inflation. And what he, what is that is going to do is that is going to collapse the global economy. That is going to collapse the debt markets. It's going to collapse the equity markets. And he will be known as Herbert Hoover, Ben Strong on steroids. He will be, his legacy will be amongst the economic villains as being not brave enough to actually tell the people and the politicians what the situation is. His other option is he takes the medicine that is unfortunately his to take based on decisions that were made throughout his lifetime before he was ever in a role of power, etc., which is he said he has to inflate the debt away. He's going to have to let the U.S. economy run through a period of inflation. Now, had he had he taken that second choice in 21 uh, or continue to do so, we'd probably be right now sitting here mid-year through the second year of 15% inflation. Um, he would probably be in yield curve control already. And U.S. debt to GDP would probably be back down to 90% or less. And we would be getting close to a period where he could then back off and say, we're going to let free markets work or just rip off the Band-Aid and surprise markets. Be like, yield curve control is over. Let rates rise sharply. Let the economy. But he would, if he would have gotten, if he would have let inflation run hot enough, to get debt to GDP low enough such that allowing markets to set interest rates did not bankrupt the United States government, he would be in a much better position. By virtue of him reversing course last year, that 15 to 20% is no longer going to cut it. It's going to have to be a more compressed period of time at a much higher rate of inflation. And that gets you in a much more dangerous territory where um, just politically, et cetera, everything. He's going to need 20, 30, 40% inflation for two, three, two, three, four years to get us out of this. And the longer he waits, allowing that to happen, that 20, 30, 40% will keep going up uh, because the debt keeps going up. It's and, and the peak cheap energy pressures keep going up. And, the geopolitical pressures keep going up and the foreign <laughs> demand for treasury secularly keeps going down. Uh, his best, you know, it's like having a bad trade on, like the best time to get rid of a bad trade is not sit there and hope it turns around, mark it down, move it out the door, go. Uh, he needed to mark down the debt, move it down, go. Um, his refusal to do so, it, 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 it's, I mean, it's just, he's, 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 he's making a mess of things for himself, for his legacy, and it's going to be way worse as a result of his um, unwillingness uh, to be brave and do the hard things that needed to be done by virtue of the decisions that have been made in the decades before. Definitely. Well, it's in a situation where he's kind of in a lose-lose in a lot of ways. To your point, probably wouldn't have taken the, taken the job if given that opportunity. I want to talk about the phenomenon you've mentioned. I've heard you talk about it before where we look at you know, what China's doing. And we'll get into the, the de-dollarization stuff here in the back end and in gold and Bitcoin, some other things. But this idea that we've been, you know, uh, selling China debt or China's been, you know, we're basically funding our military, funding our spending. And when that goes away, you know, what does it look like? You've got kind of the re-onshoring of manufacturing with the chips that we're making here. Um, just talk about some of this phenomenon 
and where these paths could lead us into the future if we want to continue to have this military strength that people seem to want to fall back on. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said 10, 12 years ago, we're borrowing money from China to build weapons to face down China. And this is not a sustainable strategy. And uh, I would add we're now doing it, you know, we're, we're, we're doing it with Chinese components in no small part. So we're borrowing money from China to build weapons from, uh, made from components made in China uh, to face down China. Uh, and oh, by the way, uh, by virtue of us running these deficits against China, we're also funding the Chinese military, which is right. has got to be the dumbest Cold War strategy I've ever seen in my <laughs> life. Um, you know, people say, well, we won the cold, the first cold. Well, we weren't paying for the Soviets military. You know, take a look at the deficits we're running against China compared to what China spends on military every year. Like the numbers aren't that different. So um, it, it is literally the dumbest strategy in the world. Now, why do we do it? Well, because we have to, because that's what the structure of the, the post $71 system requires. So um, It needs to change. It is changing. Some people want it to change within the U.S. government. Some people don't want it to change. Um, it's a matter of the U.S. national security that the dollar system does change to a system where there's a neutral reserve asset, that we don't settle our our, our, our deficits in debt. Um, so we're, we're moving in that direction. Um, it's very, very inflationary. I mean, it ultimately, you know, I, I said it in 2021, uh, if the U.S. wants to win the great power competition against China, the bond market must die on a real basis. That's it. You've got to reshore all these reshoring and uh, changing the structure of the currency. All of that is extraordinarily inflationary um, on a secular basis. And it is what it is. It has to happen. The alternative is it's fine. You just we pack up our stuff, we come home. Uh, you know, China China wins the great power competition or whatever, and and we move on. But other than that, if we want to compete, we're going to have to inflate. Yeah, for sure. Um, what about this? You know, we look at the. There's so much lately on social media around. You know, the dollar is losing its reserve currency status. People wanted to have these hot takes. Um, you know, I've written some threads about the petrodollar. It's entrenched in a lot of ways, but I love your nuanced take on this issue. So I'd love for you to just give it and then we'll dive into some of the, and some of the details on it. Yeah. The de-dollarization thing has been something we've been writing about for eight, nine years now. Um, and so it's kind of fun to actually see it get the mainstream it's getting. And, and of course it getting to the mainstream means it gets extremely polarized, right? It's, it's death of the dollar, not death of the dollar. And it's our take on it is 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 nuanced, and it is it is a matter of national security for China, Russia, and the rest of the world to be able to buy commodities in their own currency. They need to de-dollarize global energy markets. It's one of their biggest dollar outflows. Uh, they are doing this. Russia is selling out in Yuan. Russia is selling uh, in, in uh, 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 well, it's primarily in Yuan. They have sold some in other currencies, primarily in Yuan. Uh, others are as well. Paradoxically, as that begins, and this is something we wrote to clients in 2014, as the dollar loses its monopoly in global oil markets, it's actually paradoxically good for the dollar. Because you'll be talking about a slightly reduced supply of dollars in you know, oil markets are what, two plus trillion a year. Um, you start losing a little bit of dollar flows out of that. Um, you're going to have a little bit less dollar flows against a very big dollar demand for oil or excuse me, for uh, uh, to service debt. Right. Most dollar, most debt is, is dollar denominated or a lot of it is. So there's this big dollar demand from the debt out there. If you take away a little bit of the flow of dollars from a two trillion annual energy market, it supports a dollar. A little less supply, constant demand, price up. Similarly, as the yuan gains share of global energy markets, there is not a lot of yuan denominated debt. There's not an, an instilled bid for yuan. So you don't have a lot of. Oops, hold on. You don't have a lot of demand for. Yuan, but you're increasing the supply of Yuan a bit as the oil comes out of the ground in Yuan. So that it puts downward pressure on Yuan. So paradoxically, uh, 
it's actually in the short run great for the dollar, um, uh, supportive of the dollar, and, and negative for the yuan. The shift from petrodollar to petro yuan. So, like, that's the first nuance most people miss. The second mm. nuances they miss relate to two things primarily. Number one, what you know, no one's going to store the yuan. Yeah, no shit. Um, yeah. The this is not the this is not the um, the re the rebuttal that a lot of people think it is. Uh, they will they're storing it in Chinese goods and net settling in gold, and you can see Chinese it's at a floating price and you want. And because the Chinese you know people say well the Chinese aren't going to run the deficits again no shit they don't want to. Um, they don't want to, to, to run the deficits because that requires them to hollow out their manufacturing the way we did. It requires them to bankrupt themselves, the, you know, the Trippin's dilemma, the way we have done. They're not going to do that. The Europeans aren't going to do that. And the Japanese can't do that. And the British can't do that. So uh, the deficits, as, as, as commodity trade is de-dollarized, the, the related commodity deficits are being settled in Chinese goods and net settled in gold. And then the other part of it is the back end of what this means for the U.S., which is FX reserves, global central banks don't need to hold as many treasury bonds um, if they can buy energy in their own currency. They, they, they can print money for currency. They primarily run deficits. These Pretty much everyone else in the world primarily runs deficits in commodities. And so if they can print their own currency for commodities, they don't need dollars, as many dollars. They don't need to hold as many uh, treasury bonds. What they do need to hold per our prior conversation is gold because gold can maintain its value against oil and treasuries cannot, as we just talked about. And this is a part of the, my frustration with this whole assume a can opener is this whole demand, this whole de-dollarization stand uh, debate. There's almost nobody talking about peak cheap energy which is forcing it. It isn't, this isn't, people say, well, they're only doing it when they run out of dollars and reserves. No shit. Like, like of course, that's why they're doing yeah. it. Um, they are doing it because they have to, because peak cheap energy means, me, peak cheap energy means they're going to run out of dollar, uh, dollars and reserves because they are growing their economy. So their oil demand is going up. Peak cheap energy means the price of that oil is going up. So they're going to run out of dollars. And when they run out of dollars, they are, have two choices, economic Mad Max slash energy usage, people starve and die, economy collapses, or you find an energy producer willing to sell outside the dollar, Russia. Okay, there you go. And so the back end of this for the US is all of a sudden people say, oh, wait, the Russians will sell to me my own currency. Great. I don't need to buy as many of these dollar treasury bonds, and I, but I do need to own gold. And so you can see over the last 10 years, central bank gold reserves are up or $500 billion, central bank treasury reserves, FX reserves, foreign exchange reserves are down three, $400 billion. So there, it, it is a very nuanced dynamic where people want to say, well, oh, you know, make it black and white. It's not black and white, but the key is that it's peak cheap energy driven. The system will collapse if they don't de-dollarize because of peak cheap energy. Talk about this. I love that you're bringing gold into it right now, too. You've mentioned having a reserve asset. And I've heard you talk about the linkage uh, if gold and oil start to link and what the ramifications could be for the price of gold. Uh, and then also what that does in terms of the making it to where people can't manipulate it. You know, in the past, people said, oh, people are suppressing the price of gold. But you start to link it to the oil markets. Explain to people what happens then. Oil and gold are very different. Oil, gold is very different than every other commodity because it has a much higher stock to flow ratio. So stock to flow ratio is simply uh, how much supply is out there versus how much is produced annually out of the ground. So in gold, stock to flow ratios call it 60x, right? Um, all the gold, most of the gold that's ever been mined is still in existence. And so roughly 60x stock to flow ratio. In contrast, the stock to flow ratio of oil is like 1.2, right? Like when, when it gets really high inventory, it's like 1.3. And when inventories get really low and tight, it's like 1.1. Because there's it's, it's expensive to store. You don't store it. You use it. Once you burn it up, it's gone. 
So it's very select and, and it's similar for copper, or similar for wheat, corn, etc. It's kind of in between the two for silver. You can manipulate the price of gold with paper derivatives. You can manipulate the price of gold with anything, with or the price of, of anything with paper derivatives, right? So if you, you know, there's a Mickey Mantle rookie card. It's worth whatever. Let's say it's worth a million dollars. If you and I start creating fake, you know, claims on, on Mickey Mantle rookie cards, uh, let's say we create a hundred of them. Right? We're going to create a Mickey Mantle rookie card, uh, unallocated a Mickey Mantle rookie card market. And we're going to sell each of those unallocated rookie cards. Hey, you own the rookie card, right? You have, you can claim the rookie, but there's only one rookie card. The fact that the rookie card has a low stock to flow ratio, right? It's never going to be used means is we can, we can sell lots of unallocated Mickey Mantle rookie cards and never get called on our, on our, lack of a wetter word or bullshit. Uh, high stock to flow ratio, the way to think about the stock to flow ratio is how, you know, we're playing a shell game, right? So the stock, you know, the, the more, the higher the stock to flow ratio, the more cups there are under which you can hide the P. So the point here as it relates to gold is, is as long as the stock to flow ratio of gold is that high, you can separate the physical fundamentals of gold from the paper price for a very long time by selling more and more unallocated gold derivatives, selling more and more unallocated Mickey Mantle cards. Uh, the problem comes, you know, you, you can, you can do this with oil as well, right? Let's sell a bunch of, I don't know, um, you know, we'll, we'll sell a bunch of barrels of oil. And if we want to sell that many on it, but the problem is, is oil is used really fast and it's really hard to store. And so, you can't separate the physical fundamentals for very long. A 1.2 stock to flow ratio means there's only like 1.2 cups to hide the P under, right? When, when you're short oil, there's nothing else it's going to do. The, you're, the, it's going to show up in the price fast. Um, so when you're short gold, there's a lot of games you can play. You can pay people premiums to pay, buy them out of their contract. There's a lot of things you can do. Okay. So here's where connecting oil and gold start to make a difference. Let's pretend that the, not even let's pretend, is this is not pretending. As I was going to use the Mickey Mantle card example, but it, let's just, let's get right to the point. As foreign oil suppliers begin storing more, reserving more gold, as foreign oil importers begin reserving more gold, given the dynamics we talked about a little bit ago, they're not going to take paper. They're going to want the physical, uh, particularly because storing it somewhere else is risky, as we now know after what the U.S. did to FX was, yeah. uh, Russia's FX reserves. So basically, it's going to shift the oil market, the commodity market more broadly, and start reconnecting it to gold, right? So if you have oil that has a stock-to-flow ratio of 1.2 and gold with a stock-to-flow ratio of 60, but oil, as it's transacted, wants gold. What you're going to start doing is bringing the stock to flow of ratio, the stock to flow ratio of oil toward the stock to flow ratio of gold. Paper will not settle this. You can't just sell more paper, whatever. Hit the price, great. I'll just buy more gold. Uh oh. So that's where all of a sudden the paper games and oil mar or gold markets, excuse me, that have, that have, persisted for in various forms for 40, 50 years, peak cheap energy blows those games up because you need a reserve asset that can preserve its value in oil terms. And the only one that can do it right now, at least, is gold. And they're not going to take paper gold. And if they were going to take paper gold, they're not going to take it anymore after last year with what Russia did last year. And so you start connecting, reconnecting the physical gold market to the physical oil market. The physical oil market is 15 times the physical gold market in annual production terms. It's two trillion plus a year, you know, 100 million barrels a day times 70 times 365 days. Uh, so it's actually more than two trillion. The physical gold market's like 180 billion a year. Uh, may, may, maybe, maybe. So yeah, all that other stock is still there, right? There's still all the other gold that was ever owned. But like for me, 
all that other gold that was ever owned is final settlement for all the other debt. So you can't say, well, oh, well, all the other stock can address the flow of oil. No, no, no. <clears throat> if you want to do that math, it's all the other stock of gold, you know, the, the flow of oil, the flow of gold is 15x. The flow, all the other gold is eligible to solve, but then all the other debt, that 120 trillion number, you have to bring in too. So there, and certainly the FX reserves, 12 trillion in FX reserves, 10 trillion FX reserves, bring that and leave the other, you know, a lot of that debt secured. So let's just use 10 trillion FX reserves, 10 trillion. The bottom line is gold is not trading in the correct zip code uh, for a peak cheap energy world and the, and the geopolitical world we appear to be moving toward where you, where gold becomes a reserve asset for commodities and, and, um, basically oil makes gold a whole lot bigger. Yeah, definitely. Well, and I mean, if you think about gold, you get to the sovereign nature of it, the self custody nature, we'll talk about Bitcoin here in a minute, but it makes sense. It's like, what do you want to hold? And you mentioned you want, and it's like, you know, is that really going to move to a reserve currency? I don't think so, given uh, China's track record. And I've heard someone say, you know, I mean, look, as much as uh, China and Russia want to work together in Saudi Arabia and some of these BRICS countries, you know, it's like, do they trust each other any more, or any less than they trust the U.S.? I mean, at the end of the day, there's something about having this base layer um, that has that sovereign aspect to it that people can that people can remove the element of trust, right? And so that, to me even if we are moving away from the dollar in some ways uh it's you got to follow the path where's the logical outcome to where those uh where those reserves are going to go i think gold is a huge candidate there and at the end i'll talk about just ideas around an optimist case to where you would want to where the opportunities lie in this landscape but before we get to that just the banking crisis your thoughts generally on it and then i know bitcoin's done pretty well this year it's one of uh it's, it's up quite a bit since the beginning of the year it was also down quite a bit but um, I don't know. A lot of guys want to link it to, oh, see, look, these banks are failing and people are going into Bitcoin because it's like self-custody sovereign. I don't know that that's necessarily a linkage. But uh, but first, just your thoughts on you know some of these banking issues, and then we'll talk about Bitcoin and then finish it out. So, yeah, I, I for me, the banking issues are not a banking crisis. Per se. Put it this way. They didn't start out as a banking crisis. Uh this was this was a U.S. balance of payments sovereign debt crisis symptom, which is to say, go go back to 2014. Banks were regulated into buying treasuries. Um, they were really regulated into buying treasuries in 2020, where uh, the Fed needed as many treasury buyers as they could find, and so they suspended SLR supplementary leverage ratio uh, uh, regulations that. To basically exempt, not basically, they explicitly exempted treasury bonds. Uh, what did this mean? This meant that uh, banks could buy treasuries with no capital requirement. What a great deal, right? You have to have yeah. no, you have no capital, you infinite leverage buying treasuries. Well, awesome. If I can borrow as much money as I want effectively and, and make 2%, that sounds great. Um, sign me up. And the banks all did. You can see the biggest marginal financier of of one of the one of the two the two biggest marginal financiers of the U.S. government over the last ten years has been the Fed and U.S. banks. No one ever thought far enough ahead of like, okay, well, how do we get out of this? They just said, all right, well, we're gonna we're gonna only do the SLR exemptions for a year, and they did. And the the thing that was never supposed to happen was inflation was never supposed to show up. You, you look at one common theme of all the disaster, you know. Long-term capital management, when they blew up, it was, well, they were, you know, they had this problem and that problem. And that, but when you look across the thread of, of everything that went on for them, they were short quality and long shit and volatility went up, right? So all of their shorts ran on them and all their, you know, or all their shorts ran on them and all their longs collapsed. The entire regulatory process over the last 10 years has been regulate Western interests into buying more treasuries because foreign central banks stop. And it all works fine. The thread connecting it all is as long as inflation never shows up. Inflation shows up, holy cow, you get what we got last year. And the Fed panics and, and raises rates very aggressively. And uh, when they do, 
you've got this problem where the banks are underwater on their treasuries and they need to sell them, but they can't because then they have to book the losses. And, and it's that's sort of step one. That is just a flat out symptom of this balance of payments problem this, that, that we've been talking about for the U.S. Once global central banks stopped growing their holdings of treasuries eight years ago. But now the longer this goes on, uh, the more sinister it gets. And we're seeing that, right? So commercial real estate, we are seeing markdowns in commercial real estate that are just eye-watering, just face-peeling. You know, one in San Francisco down 80% in three years. Uh, a couple more in the Wall Street Journal today down 60 to 70%. If you're down 60 to 70%, like across too much of your loan portfolio, now you start to get into some very systemic issues. And commercial real estate office is a really big category. Uh, and you can say, well, at least light commercial be okay. And then you kind of look at the charts of internet spending versus retail spending in stores and you go, uh-oh. Um, yeah. So the... And then you, I mean, look, yield curves inverted by 180 basis points, 10 year, three month. Uh, you know what bank is doing great? The bank of Luke Groman is doing awesome because yeah. right now I've got a 2.7% 30 year fixed mortgage that I'm going to pay every last payment. And I'm cash collateralized in my life insurance policy tax free and I'm making five. My, my net interest mark, the bank of Luke Groman is awesome. And even if I didn't want to, even if I didn't have the insurance policy set up, I could do, you know, a money market fund and I could be cash collateralized in that and make five. So the U.S. government is crowding out its own banking system. It's upside down on uh, its net interest margin. It's looking at credit problems across commercial real estate. And so what started as uh, a really a, a U.S. balance of payments problem symptom is now running the risk of getting much more sinister. Um, and, and again, in the end, it's all just a symptom of the crowding out. It's, it's just, it's just, this is the, you know, for our whole lives, well, debt doesn't matter. The U.S. debt doesn't matter. Yes, it does. The banks are a symptom of, yes, it does matter. Uh, the inflation finally showed up and it all went pie pear-shaped and now it matters. And so that is... Um, I think it, it runs, unless the Fed, the Fed face is a real important choice. And it goes back to the choice I made earlier, which is cut rates, get banks back to a positive net interest margin, start reinflating assets, let the currency go. Or like I said, Powell's going to be, um, his legacy is going to be remembered with Herbert Hoover and with Benjamin Strong and all of the goats and that by that i don't mean greatest of all time by the by that i mean the guys blamed for the great depression yeah yeah that's good uh last piece here just what are the optimistic okay. takes around what people can do given all the backdrop that you've outlined here for the last hour uh what are you doing yourself i mean obviously it's not investment advice but just uh, some thoughts on ways to take advantage of opportunities yeah for me i would encourage the average investor if somebody tells you they know what's going to happen over the next three months, six months, 12 months, run, run in the other yeah. direction. Nobody has a clue. Nobody alive has ever seen this combination of debt, derivatives, geopolitics, technology deflation, and peak cheap energy all rolled into one. And so the first thing I would tell you is for me personally, the way I'm thinking about it is I have no conviction in what's going to happen over the next three to six months. Um, I have extremely high conviction in what's going to, how this cycle is ultimately going to end, which is going to be a sustained period of very elevated inflation. And so I'm managing my own, um, you know, my own, uh, funds in a, a barbell strategy is what we refer to. I am overweight cash. I am overweight short-term treasury bonds. I own very few of any other bonds. Uh, in fact, the, <laughs> I'm effectively short uh, 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 30 year mortgages, right? By virtue of borrowing at 2.75% for 30 years. I've got 28 years left on that bad boy um, and I'll pay every last. Uh, that's effectively a short of duration. Um, 
So I'm liquid on one end. I have an effect, a de facto, um, you know, a modest mortgage um, uh, that's effectively a short of duration, long term. That doesn't, you know, it's a great position because I don't have to market to market. Nothing, right? Um, and then I've got uh, I'm overweight gold. I'm overweight Bitcoin. Uh, I own some energy. I own some uh, some commodity EV related uh, commodities, copper um, uh, names in particular. Uh, that benefit from electrification. Uh, I own uh, 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 some, uh, uh, some positions in electrical infrastructure related uh, industrial equity. Uh, so it's this bifurcated view of uh, I have no idea in the short run. Like I can paint you a picture of really bad, really good, somewhere in the middle. I think volatility is going to remain high. And so I want to have the cash and liquidity, but then I also am overweight these other things where I, I am you know, overall low levered. Um, and so I can wait out the volatility. To me, it's very, very clear that they are going to have to inflate significantly. And so that's where the gold, the Bitcoin, the gold miners, some of these more uh, in, uh, inflation sensitive uh, and, and domestic reshoring sensitive uh, plays come in. Um, while still acknowledging like, hey, in the in the short run, it's it, it, it could get really ugly. Um, so that's that's where I'm at. That's good, Luke. I appreciate you coming back on. This is always fun. I love uh, I love reading your tweets, love following your research, but it's it's the most fun to be able to talk uh, and hear you address these uh, these things going on in the macro. Where's the best place for people to find you at? Sure. So you can check us out on uh, website FFTT-LLC.com for more information about what we're up to in different mass market and institutional product offerings. And on Twitter at Luke Groman, L-U-K-E-G-R-O-M-E-N. All right. Thanks, Luke. Thanks for coming on. All right. Thanks for me, Ben.